happy Easter. I invite you all to join us this morning as we begin worship. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my Till I met you, I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. You were. Hey there, everybody. I'm Brady. Thanks for spending Easter with us. Before we get started, we wanted to give you a look at some things happening here at Friendship. Every Sunday at 9.30 a.m., we have Christ-centered discipleship happening in our Sunday school. Using the Gospel Project, we've got age-based Bible teaching, which helps us understand the unfolding story from Genesis to Revelation. Our classes help participants of all ages study the Bible in an age-appropriate way. If you'd like to get connected to a Sunday school class, go to friendshipbc.com slash Sunday for more information. 
Wednesday nights are alive and active here at Friendship. We've got age-based Bible teaching and discipleship training for children, students, and adults starting at 6.30 p.m. each week. Our youngest members go to Awana. Teens take part in our Overflow Youth Group, and adults get their hearts and minds fed through our adult Bible study. Plan to join us with the whole family this week. And for more information, go to friendshipbc.com. When you commit to regular budgeted giving, you help our ministry accomplish its goals and you are part of the team that meets spiritual and physical needs in our broader community. The easiest way to give is through our online portal at friendshipbc.com give. Our mission as a church only moves forward through your generosity and faithfulness. Even though some of us meet in person and some online, we don't need to be apart. You can stay connected to our church family in many different ways. If you need help either getting connected or reconnected, send us an email to info at friendshipbc.com and one of our pastors will work with you this week to find your place here at Friendship. Good morning, Friendship. Good morning, Friendship. Sorry. Uh, We're going to, for our call, he is risen. He is risen. That's awesome. Happy Easter. We're going to read from Romans chapter 5 as our call to worship, um, which still goes along with the uh, New City Catechism. And that we're on question 14. So if you want to turn to Romans uh, 5, we'll read, start reading in verse 12. But the New City Catechism question is, did God create us unable to keep his law? And the, response, the answer to that is uh, no. But because of disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve, all creation is fallen. We are all born into sin and guilt, corrupt in our nature and unable to keep God's law. So let's read in Romans chapter 5, verse 12 on down. Therefore... Just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even, even over those who are sin, whose sinning was not like the transgressions of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following the trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought through justification. For if because of one man's trespass, Death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life through one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in its to, in to increase our trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that sin reigned in death. Grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this Easter morning and all that it represents. Fathers, as we come before you, help our hearts to worship you rightly. We thank you for the gift of uh, music and voices to sing. Um, We thank you for your word that can be proclaimed, that we can hear from you, and our hearts can be changed, and we can follow you well. In Christ's name, amen. You'll stand with us as we continue in worship.
great things. See what our Savior has done. We'll see how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Oh, He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. Some great things we dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Faithful through every storm. Be thankful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. Oh God, you do great things. Oh, hero. You conquer the grave, you free and free cast and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. morning church happy Easter if you have your Bibles with you I invite you to turn to the book of Luke chapter 24 Luke chapter 24 and if you haven't noticed I got a really cool Easter present this morning isn't this cool I feel like I'm actually a pastor now after six years thank you that's fine uh, some of you got Easter presents this morning. I got one too, and I'm really loving this big old pulpit. Um, thanks to Dave Sears and Pastor Rob for putting it together. Um, very, very happy young man this morning, I am. Uh, Luke, enough about me. Let's go and talk about Jesus. Luke chapter 24. I'm going to pray. Father, as we gather together, we praise you for this day and for your purposes in it. We ask that you might reset our agendas and as we sit in your presence recalibrate our intentions, refocus our hearts. Your will for our lives does not always reflect our plans, so Lord, change our plans to reflect your will. 
Help us understand that we don't necessarily need full clarity to walk in the unique purpose that you've laid in our lives. Lift our eyes to seek you first today and always. Surrendering ourselves to you, shifting our perspectives to seek your peace and your presence above all else. In every situation we ponder in our daily lives, let the Holy Spirit show us your commands. Give us renewed strength and godly courage to obey you. Uh, Forgive us for striving beyond our means, for worry, for forcing results in our lives, because only you know what lies ahead. Let peace be real to us today as we seek you more than anything else. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 36. And they were talking about these things. Jesus himself stood among them, saying, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened, and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate before them. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. This is God's word to us. Well, 23 years ago, I celebrated my very first Easter as a believer in Jesus Christ. I have now officially lived half my life as a follower of Jesus. You can do the math if you're so inclined. But at the time, I had been a believer only for a handful of months having come to know Christ just before Christmas the year earlier. Uh, Christy and I, by God's providence, attended First Baptist Church in Concord, New Hampshire. Back in 1998, it was old school Baptist church. Uh, Pews, hymnals, little old men in suits, smiling and greeting and shaking your hands as you entered the door, which was quite nice. Uh, We had no idea what we were doing. Uh, We were also living on a shoestring at the time, so I did my best that morning to find my cleanest dirty shirt and try to look presentable. Uh, My wife's beautiful in whatever she wears, so she was just fine. Our oldest son, who's now 23, of course, was a newborn at the time. He was in his little car seat. I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew that Jesus was alive, and that day was so tremendously important that our new little family had to be at that old church to celebrate this Savior that had just saved us and changed our lives. The pastor, who I still remember quite clearly, Reverend Reverend Eli Mercer, uh, he saw the two kids, four kids walking around with a car seat, actually came over and talked to us, and um, it was really cool. I remember what he said to us about Noah. He said, uh, it's a wonderful name because the Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and certainly has been true for our son. It's not often that we can recall specific sermons or messages that we hear, but I don't know if I'll ever forget that one. It was Easter, and so he shared actually from this chapter, Luke 24. He actually shared how the two disciples uh, on the Emmaus Road had their hearts burn within them as they listened to the Christ unrecognized and explained the Old Testament to them. I don't necessarily remember everything that he said, but I do remember that he said their hearts burned within them. And that was how my life had been changed. My heart was burning within me. And what he said has always stayed with me. Now, I'm not that guy in 23 years from now. You may not even remember coming here today. But I want our hearts, too, to burn within us. Luke chapter 24 is the chapter to make that happen. This chapter actually shows us the three big 
scenes of that first Easter. Uh, The first, of course, the women at the tomb uh, speaking with the angels. That is quite familiar to us, and rightly so. Second is the road to Emmaus scene. Third is our text, which is the one that I want to focus on this resurrection day. The risen Christ standing in the midst of his startled disciples on that what would have been Easter evening. What's quite amazing is that all three scenes in this chapter follow the same pattern. There's confusion, there's reprimand from Jesus, there's instruction, and then there's a call to witness. And so as we take up this final scene of the first Easter, it, it's almost comical. There is a, there's confusion here that is bordering on pandemonium. If, if you come from the corporate world, if you've ever worked at a job where you have to have staff meetings, you probably know what's going on here in this room. They don't know what's going on, so what do you do when you don't know what's going on? You get everyone together so you, you can then share that confusion with everyone else in the room. That's what it's like to work in corporate America if you want to know. Get everyone together. Peter saw the empty tomb. The guys on the road to Emmaus reported what they had seen. The women stated their story with the angels. And so now, with burning hearts, they're together trying to figure out what is happening. So we're going to take four steps through this passage following those natural breaks that are here. Confusion, reprimand, instruction, and witness. Let's start with confusion. Look at verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. So they're all giving their reports. Peter gets up, gives his report, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, uh, perhaps the women, uh, maybe even Joseph of Arimathea was there and said, No, we actually buried him. Uh, This makes no sense. Jesus is dead. I mean, we all saw it. At least John and some of the women saw it happen. The rest of us We were aware that he was entombed. We know the guy that gave us the tomb. And so all of these eyewitnesses, something's going on here. Either they were overcome with emotional turmoil to the point where they were hallucinating, or they were lying, or maybe Jesus was truly alive and their reports were true. Well, here's the irony. That's exact that what is going on is is exactly what Jesus had been teaching them all along. In Mark 9, he says, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. What was he talking about? He's talking about this moment. He wasn't talking about thousands and thousands of years in the future. That made no sense for the people that he's talking to at the time. He's talking about this. The kingdom of God had pierced the veil of human history, not only in the incarnation, but especially in the resurrection. The kingdom of God, listen to me, the kingdom of God is not something we are waiting to happen. The kingdom of God is now. The kingdom of God is us. It's Jesus. It's all who are part of the new covenant. Look around the room. You are seeing the kingdom of God. And with every soul that is added to the kingdom of God, the kingdom expands. Jesus said in Mark 1, repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand. And here it is. Amen. I like that kid. Later in Mark 9, the Bible says, they went on from there and passed through Galilee and he did not want anyone to know for he was teaching his disciples saying to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. The Bible goes on and says, but they didn't understand what he was saying, but they were too afraid to say, what are you talking about? He said, this is exactly what will happen. Step one, I'll be arrested. Step two, I'll be tried as a criminal. Step three, I'll be executed as a criminal. Step four, I'll rise from the grave. The kingdom pierces the veil. The prophetic words of Jesus are on full display in their truth. And so there they are, uh, all hearing these reports when suddenly Jesus is there. He didn't stand at the door and knock. He didn't climb in through a window. He wasn't there. And then he was there. (laughs) Can you imagine? You're all in a big circle talking about Jesus and then he's in the middle of it all. Hey. Hey. I'm sure they jumped right out of their skin when this happened. I mean, we read this, like, Jesus was there, and they'll peace be to you. They were terrified out of their minds. It was Jesus. And I love the humor of our Lord. He just goes, 
peace to you. <laughs> Which to me is kind of comical. I mean, not only is he settling the debate, but he scares them and now he says, peace to you. I mean, peace on earth is a beautiful thing. Peace on earth had been the announcement at his birth, but they didn't have a lot of peace in their hearts, only disbelief. And here they're confused and stunned and scared. And then Jesus shows up. The second thing we see is the reprimand. It's our second heading. Look at verse 38. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for the spirit, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. So they felt for themselves in solid flesh, and they even touched the open wounds. Jesus is physically there. It was his body, the same one he had been using for 30-something years, but now raised to a much higher position. The materiality of the resurrection is an undeniable fact. And then there's a wonderful shift in the apostles in verse 41. They still disbelieved for joy. They still disbelieved for joy. It's like, I can't believe it. Is it really him? And then it's beautiful. It is so, the Bible is so beautiful. What is the first thing that Jesus asked them for? Get some food? Give me some food? So Jesus, he asked me, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. So listen to me. Don't be ashamed when you go to a friend's house and ask for a snack. It's the most Easter, Christ-like, Christian thing you can do. Walk in. Do you have any snacks? I am here. Now, I'm not comparing myself to Jesus. I am in Christ, but I am not Christ. But I will still ask for snacks if I go to your house. This wasn't the only time that Jesus would do this either. He was fed by his apostles on uh, several occasions. We need to learn this lesson well. Jesus took naps. Jesus had snacks. We are vindicated, aren't we? Amen, somebody. I'm going to make t-shirts. Jesus had snacks. Jesus took naps. Be like Jesus. Oh, we but I'm sure after this, none of, the, none of the, the men present doubted, or any of them doubted the resurrection ever again. So in this reprimand, Jesus' reprimand, is he's asking, why are you troubled? Why are you so doubtful? I told you this was going to happen, and here I am. Jesus was really, what's going on here is he's preparing them for the gravity of the mission that was to follow. What we're seeing here is the course of redemptive history playing out. You could start with the incarnation of the Christ. The incarnation, of course, is followed by the crucifixion. The crucifixion followed by the resurrection. The resurrection followed by the ascension. The ascension followed by our mission. Our mission followed by Christ's return. Christ's return followed by eternity. So there's this plan of redemption that's taking place here. There's a lot to be celebrating. But the work is just beginning. The challenges were just beginning for these people. Peter was so sure of his faith in the risen Christ that he too was crucified. But he was crucified upside down at his own request because he didn't want to die the same way Jesus did. Because he didn't feel like he was worthy. Andrew and Bartholomew and Thomas were killed. Modern day India and even the Soviet Union. It's not the Soviet Union anymore. Whatever they call themselves today. But... They brought the gospel to the ends of the earth, and they died for it. Philip would take the gospel to Africa. He would be put to death in Africa. Matthew, the tax collector, uh, and the writer of the gospel records, took the, the ministered in Ethiopia, history tells us. And he, too, was killed for the sake of the gospel. James is reckoned to have ministered in Syria, where Josephus, the first century historian, tells us that he was not only stoned to death, they, after they finished stoning him, they put him over on the other side, and they clubbed him to death again. They killed him twice, I guess. So the fate of the, and the same thing happened to the others as well. John, the writer of the book of John and the Revelation, he's the only one of the apostles generally thought to have died a natural death in his old age. During the persecution of one of the subsequent Roman governors, John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, and that's where he would receive the revelation from the ascended Christ. But each of the 11, and then of course the 12, Matthias who would be added later, they left families and careers traveling to distant countries declaring that Jesus died and came back to life. 
And for that proclamation, they were beaten, imprisoned, and killed. Did they have any basis for declaring that Jesus was alive? Yes, because they saw it. They were witnesses to it. It is undisputed that the tomb was empty. And then there's a lot of controversy from the skeptic saying, well, the apostles likely only stole his body. But if the disciples made it all up, Each of them allowed himself to be executed for what they knew to be a lie. It doesn't make any sense. Who would die for something they knew was a lie? What does make sense, though, is historical fact. Jesus was humiliated, beaten, whipped, nailed to the cross where he died on display before the public. A spear was thrust into his side to make sure that he was dead. He was buried in a stone tomb. Roman soldiers guarded the tomb assigned by the religious establishment. But on the third day, the guards had fled, the tomb was open, and the only thing remaining was some burial clothes. And starting that day, the disciples said that they saw Jesus physically alive multiple times. So he had hundreds of others. They had lengthy conversations with him and ate with him, all after witnessing his death. And when ordered not to speak about his resurrection, what did they say? We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. These disciples risked their lives to speak out about what they had no doubts about, that Jesus has risen from the dead, proving that he was everything that he claimed to be, the Son of God. Third, then, we see the instruction that Jesus gives. If you look at verse 45. He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. I was looking at a very recent study this week from Barna, which is like a Christian uh, version of Gallup. Um, One of their studies said 75% of churchgoers in the United States have either never heard of the Great Commission, or if they had heard of it, they really didn't know what it was. 75% of people that go to the church in the United States do not understand the one big thing Jesus commanded us to do. Only 17% of respondents to that survey had any idea of what the Great Commission was. Friends, not only did Jesus die on the cross in the place of sinners, but he took up his own life on the third day and demonstrated his authority as God over Satan's sin and death. And in that proof of his godness and his deity, he comes to us and he gives us this great commission. Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and I am with you always to the end of the age. He has risen just as he says he would. He will return again to judge the living and the dead. Therefore, he asks us to go and tell the world that Jesus is the Christ. He commissions his disciples to make disciples of all nations. We tend to envision the the go part as the, the big command. It's typically how it's presented in our culture, our church culture. We hear about global missions. You gotta go. Friends, if there's anything that that, that Christians are good at in the United States, it's going. Everyone's going, going, going. But you're not getting anywhere. But we're always going, aren't we? Got to go. Jesus said go. Go where? I don't know. I just got to go. And judging by the way half of you drive, you're not paying attention even when you're going. Amen, somebody. That's the other half. Us good drivers. If you are to make disciples, we do so by going, because going is part of it. But there's also two more parts, going, baptizing, and teaching. It's this continual action until we reach the end of the age. Ask yourself a question, why were you saved? Well, I was saved because the old story was told to me. I walked the aisle and the girl said, you were saved. You were saved for the glory of God and for your sake to avoid the wrath of God and to bring others to that same saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's why you were saved. We all have different stories on how that happened, but we were saved for a purpose. 
all Christians, we are missionaries sent out for the sake of the name of Christ. And if you're not preaching the gospel and calling sinners to repentance and faith, you're not going. You're not doing what Christ has asked you to do. You say, Goulet, it's Easter. Give us some good feeling. That's your job to make disciples. Yes, it is. And guess what? Before I came up this morning, I was Googling Christian. And it said, under your name, your job too is the Great Commission. Just like me. I certainly get the unique ability to, to, to do what I do in a special way week after week in this context, but it is our job. It is our job. And you Patriots fans in here, you'll recognize our logo. Do your job. Who wants to see revival take place? Everyone tells me, oh, I want to see revival take place, Pastor. You want to take place. Do your job and it will. The only way for revival to take place is for Christians to be about the business that Jesus has given us. Who wants to see the next generation love Jesus and serve Him? Do your job. What's the job? It's the gospel. It's sharing the gospel message. We must be saved from the judgment of God due to our sin. All are separated from God due to our sin. We need to repent of our sin and believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus rising from the grave was God's way of saying everything that Jesus said about himself is true. Repent of your sin and believe in him. Church, do your job. We are going, we are baptizing, and we're teaching. And when I say we, I mean we. The content of this teaching is specifically everything that Jesus has commanded us. In essence, in essence, it's the entire body of doctrine we call the faith. Everything from Genesis to Revelation. Jesus doesn't want us to learn five verses and nothing else in our life ever. He wants us to know the whole of Scripture. It's one of the reasons we take three years to go through a single book of the Bible here. It's not because I want to bore you to tears. Maybe that happens. It's because I want you to know the Scripture. We want you to know the Scripture because it's all geared towards our teaching and our maturity, and so the body of Christ can be effective in our culture. And friends, if we're not going and baptizing and teaching, we're just not doing our job. But here's the good news, church. The promise given to us is that we seek to fulfill each aspect of the Great Commission, but Jesus Christ is with us even to the end of the age. God blesses us in the work that He commands us to do. He hasn't left us to do this alone. Jesus says the actual promise is His presence with us as we do the great work. The duration of the blessing is till Jesus returns. We do our job. Why? That repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations. Fourth heading then is witness. Look at verse 48. It says, You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of the Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. He led them out as far as Bethany. Lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up to heaven. C.S. Lewis talking about the ascension of the Christ. He said, The disciples first saw a short vertical movement, then a vague luminosity, and then... Nothing. That's exactly what they saw. That was a translation of Jesus locally and bodily from this earth into the very presence of His Father, seated now at His right hand. Jesus, His, his humanity didn't evaporate when He went back into glory. It's a very real translation of His resurrected human body to the throne of God where He will dwell until the great day of judgment. And it would take years and years and years to outline all the significant ways that Jesus is currently ruling and how that affects us every day. I mean, for starters, I think of one obvious way, this world has become clown world. Absolute clown world. Just turn on the news. It's straight up clown world, isn't it? It's like every day you're waiting for the next headline to come out about how it's even more clown world than it was yesterday. Is that offensive? I don't care. It's clown world. It's very true. Crime, 
the unintended consequences of the sexual revolutionaries, the, the tension and strife that is everywhere, poverty, famine, racism, hatred, lies, deceit. So we can look at all of that and think, well, it doesn't seem like grace is winning. But then we come to the Bible and we read about this down payment, a deposit guaranteeing the total reign of grace one day. Right now, we've seen the pledge. Jesus is ascended and he's gone on before us. But one day we'll see the rest of the reality that all of that truth will bring in. And maybe you're just struggling with assurance as a believer in Jesus Christ. You're like, man, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like, I don't feel like a Christian. I'll tell you right now, my life is messed up. My thoughts are messed up. Everything I do is messed up. Am I really a Christian? Did I really get saved when I think I did? My life doesn't feel like it. Maybe I'm the clown in the clown world. And then we see that Jesus has ascended into heaven, and we see that Jesus' work has worked. And all that he has done, and all that he does, saves even a clown like me. If you're in Christ, welcome to the circus. Because what he has done is powerful enough to save sinners. Maybe you're looking at your own body. This morning, you get up and you're looking in the mirror and you're like, Ooh, who's that? That didn't used to be there. That's not where it used to be. Maybe there's disease trying to kill you right now or somebody else you love has a disease and it's working to kill them. Sometimes it doesn't feel like Jesus is king. My body and my world is falling apart. But then we know that Jesus has arisen and he has ascended. So while in our flesh we are oppressed by sin, but in our flesh we will be glorified and transformed just like Jesus, and we will see God. Jesus all throughout the Gospels, and I'm paraphrasing what he said, but basically he said, what happens to me will happen to you. And so we look at the negative, and we're like, yeah, I mean, Jesus will face persecution, uh, we'll face trials, we'll face challenges, we'll face heartache and losses. Jesus even says we will face the cross. I mean, he says, take up your cross daily, and follow me. So yes, we will face what Jesus faced. However, we will face what Jesus faced. We too will see a resurrection. We too will be transformed. We too will see God. Because what happens to Jesus will happen to us. And we will stand with him in glory in Christ. The inheritance of Jesus becomes our inheritance. And so where on earth does this land in our lives today? I, I think it, it comes down to this. We are witnesses of the Christ. We are witnesses of the Christ. Acts chapter 5 says that these people bore witness of all these things. What were all these things? The God of our Father raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Death, resurrection, and exaltation to the right hand of God were given to Christ so that he would send his spirit to grant repentance, which provides salvation. And those are the primary facets of the gospel, and they are what true witnesses proclaim. So friends, I'll, I'll end this way. I would not be standing here today. My wife would not be in this room today. My children would not be following Jesus today if it were not for the bold witness of one person. One person boldly doing their job. One bold witness for Jesus. Through that one person, Jesus saved me. And then through me, Jesus saved my wife. And now through us, we're, we're giving a godly legacy in the Goulet family for generations to come. The Goulets were loggers from Canada. And before that, I'm pretty sure we were horse thieves running from justice from France, and we came over to Canada. Ancestry.com doesn't tell us about that. But whatever we were, we are now followers of the living Christ. And glory to God. Are you bold enough to change someone's eternity with what you know? You'll also be changing their family tree. Happy Easter. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Let's do our job. Let's pray.
And then the team is going to come up and we're going to sing another song before we're dismissed. Dear God, we thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives. We thank you for your goodness and your blessing over us. We thank you that you are able to bring hope for even the darkest and toughest of times, strengthening us for your purposes. Thank you for your great love and care. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you that you are always with us and will never leave us. Thank you for your incredible sacrifice so that we might have freedom and life. Forgive us when we don't thank you enough for who you are, for all that you do, for all that you've given. Help us to set our eyes and our hearts on you afresh today. May this be our resurrection day. Renew our spirits. Fill us with your peace and with your joy. We love you and we certainly need you this day and every day. We give you praise and thanks because you alone are worthy of it. In Christ's name, amen. Give beauty for us.
Praise God. Let's pray. And we'll head out into the world to do what the Lord has called us to do. Father God, we thank You for such a wonderful morning where we can come together as Your redeemed to glorify You in worship. We pray, Lord, that as we leave, we might continue to do so in the balance of our lives. Lord, give us a new perspective, a fresh perspective on Your mission for us. Draw us closer to You. Make us more like Christ. We glorify You that we were here together in person in 2021. And we pray that that continues, Lord, for Your sake and Your glory. We glorify You in the powerful name of Jesus. Say it with me. Amen. Amen.